On April 9, 1865, General Robert E. Lee surrendered his army to Ulysses S. Grant at Virginia's Appomattox Courthouse, effectively ending the Civil War. During the final decisive battles of the war, many men lost their lives as the Confederacy desperately tried to fight against the Union troops that overran them. But on that fateful day in 1865, General Lee's surrender set the precedent for other massive surrenders that led to the official end of the war. Today, we're exploring what happened during the final hours of the Civil War. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel and let us know in the comments below what other Civil War stories you would like to hear about. Okay, the terms of this video are unconditional and immediate. The bloodiest war in U.S. history almost ended a few days earlier, when Lee's officers pleaded with the general to surrender. The soldiers were ragged, starving, and ready to quit. But the general was stubborn, declaring the South had sacred principles to maintain and rights to defend. Ulysses S. Grant sent Lee a note to remind him how hopeless pushing on would be. But Lee pressed on, knowing it was hopeless. Over the course of four bloody years, Union and Confederate troops clashed in battle after battle, but both sides were growing weary. By April of 1865, James Longstreet, a close confidant of General Robert E. Lee, informed the general that the beginning of the end was now at hand, following several Confederate losses. The push for Lee to surrender came from many of his fellow officers and subordinates. On April 7, 1865, his closest aides confronted him. General Long told him, perceiving the difficulties that surrounded the army and believing its extraction hopeless, a number of the principal officers, from a feeling of affection and sympathy for the commander-in-chief, and with a wish to lighten his responsibility and soften the pain of defeat, volunteered to inform him that, in their opinion, the struggle had reached a point where further resistance was hopeless, and that the contest should be terminated and negotiations open for a surrender of the army. But both Lee and Longstreet were dead set on proceeding, with Longstreet urging Confederate forces to fight on. Lee forged ahead, and the Battle of Appomattox Courthouse began. By 1865, the Confederate Army was in shambles. Confederate General John Brown Gordon recalled, the Army of Northern Virginia had become the mere skeleton of its former self. This assessment did very little to discourage Lee. Instead, the general rode everywhere, encouraging soldiers to keep up with the war effort. As Gordon later wrote, Lee was often exposed to great danger from shells and bullets during these rides. Eventually, his officers recommended surrender, to which Lee responded negatively, insisting they must continue fighting. Per Gordon, Lee knew the soldiers' devotions to the cause and their devotion to him, but he was not ready to consider the necessity for surrender. But none of that mattered at Appomattox when Ulysses S. Grant stepped up to the plate. Following a debate over whether he should surrender, Lee decided to carry on the fight. Meanwhile, Union General Ulysses S. Grant was cooking up a plan to stop General Lee. Grant knew the Confederate soldiers were running on empty. After speaking with a captured Confederate general the previous night, he learned everything he needed to know to set the stage for the war's end. The general told Grant, General Ewell had said that when we had got across the James River, he knew their cause was lost, and it was the duty of their authorities to make the best terms they could, while they still had a right to claim concessions. The Confederate soldiers knew they were doomed and continued their fruitless campaign to convince Lee to surrender. General Grant, sensing an opportunity to take control of the situation, sent a note to Lee from across the battlefield. Per Longstreet's account from the battle, a flag of truce appeared under torchlight in front of Mahone's line, bearing a note to General Lee. Speaking of that note, before he was the 18th President of the United States and advocated heavily for civil rights for everyone, Grant was a true leader on the battlefield. In his April 7th note to Lee, Grant wrote, The results of the last week must convince you of the hopelessness of further resistance on the part of the Army of Northern Virginia in this struggle. I feel that it is so, and regard it as my duty to shift from myself the responsibility of any further effusion of blood by asking of you the surrender of that portion of the Confederate Army known as the Army of Northern Virginia. U.S. Grant, Lieutenant General. Lee disagreed with Grant about the hopelessness of his army's plight and wrote back, General, I have received your note of this date. Though not entertaining the opinion you express of the hopelessness of further resistance on the part of the Army of Northern Virginia, 
I reciprocate your desire to avoid useless effusion of blood, and therefore, before considering your proposition, ask the terms you will offer on condition of its surrender. R. E. Lee, General. Correspondence between the two generals continued as Lee retreated to the west, eventually leading to the famous meeting at Appomattox. But there were more hurdles to overcome before the fateful meeting would take place. As the war was winding down, Lee's army began to show signs of crumbling, and a Union victory was at hand. Grant's troops saw victory within their sights. With the tactical advantage on their side and their spirits high, they marched as fast as they could without a single straggler among them. As Grant would later write in his memoirs, Union troops moved with alacrity and without any straggling. They began to see the end of what they had been fighting four years for. Nothing seemed to fatigue them. They were ready to move without rations and travel without rest until the end. General Philip Sheridan, who ran a Union cavalry force, outran Lee's forces and blocked their retreat. At the end of it all, Sheridan cut Lee's army off from provisions and took 6,000 prisoners in the area of Sailor's Creek. Such escapades became the catalyst for increased Confederate deserters and Lee's eventual surrender. On the morning of April 9th, Sheridan sent a note to Union officer Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain reading, I have cut across the enemy at Appomattox Station and captured three of his trains. If you can possibly push your division up here tonight, we will have great results in the morning. When he wasn't busy crushing the South's food supplies or seizing rail lines to prevent travel, Sheridan led his cavalry on a mission to rout Confederate troops. Meanwhile, Grant and Lee's correspondence continued, with Lee sending another note to the Union general the previous night, after receiving Grant's correspondence late in the evening. I did not intend to propose the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia, but to ask the terms of your proposition. To be frank, I do not think the emergency has arisen to call for the surrender of this army. But as the restoration of peace should be the sole object of all, I desired to know whether your proposals would lead to that end. Lee agreed to meet with Grant at 10 a.m. the following day, but Grant wasn't keen on the idea. A few more exchanges followed, culminating in... General Gordon ended up leading one final desperate charge against the Union Army, capturing two pieces of Union artillery in the process. Gordon later wrote of his pride in the battle, saying, the brave boys in tattered gray cheered as their battle flags waved in triumph on that last morning. But as Gordon and his soldiers celebrated, Union troops continued to advance. The troops had marched through the night for the sole purpose of cornering Lee's army. It was risky, but it worked. Grant reported that his division moved so fast that it surprised the enemy as they awoke that day. As Grant later reflected, this led to a sharp engagement that surrounded Robert E. Lee's army and cut them off from supplies. The battle ultimately ended with Lee waving a white flag. He was a bit melodramatic about it, too. At the end of it all, he declared, There is nothing left for me to do but to go and see General Grant, and I would rather die a thousand deaths. On April 9th, Grant and Lee sat in the parlor of Wilmer McLean's house and negotiated the terms of the Confederacy's surrender. On the afternoon of April 9, 1865, Grant wasn't exactly dressed for the end of a war. He didn't expect his efforts to pay off so quickly and was dressed in what he called rough garb. He was ready when Lee waved the white flag, even if some Union troops suspected it to be a ruse to allow some Confederate soldiers to run away. But it was no ruse, and a few hours later, the two generals held their fateful meeting in the McLean House just outside of Appomattox. Lee showed up in full military regalia, complete with a valuable sword. Reflecting on the meeting, Grant later recalled, In my rough traveling suit, I must have contrasted very strangely with a man so handsomely dressed, six feet high, and of faultless form. In the parlor of McLean's home, Grant and Lee discussed the terms of surrender alone. After their initial conversation, they were joined by other officers. General Horace Porter described the scene. We entered and found General Grant sitting at a marble top table in the center of the room, and Lee sitting beside a small oval table near the front window, in the corner opposite to the door by which we entered, and facing General Grant. They quietly let themselves in as the surrender talks continued. During the surrender talks, Grant rapidly wrote down his terms for Lee's surrender. As he looked at Lee, he stopped to look at the ornate sword at the officer's side. As he did so, Grant decided requiring Confederate officers to surrender their swords would be an unnecessary humiliation. Having successfully secured a surrender, he didn't want to deprive them of their baggage, swords, and horses. 
So he added a line to the official terms of surrender, stating, This will not embrace the sidearms of the officers, nor the private horses or baggage. Following a review of Grant's terms, Lee penned his own letter, agreeing to them. The two generals shook hands, and Lee walked to the front steps of McLean's home. As he stood on the lowest step, he gazed in the direction of the valley, rubbing his hands together absently. Lee didn't notice the group of Union officers who respectfully stood as he walked. Porter, who observed the event, described it as a solemn occasion. As Lee walked away, Grant emerged from the house and saluted the former Confederate general with his hat. Lee returned the gesture and rode off into the sunset to break the news of his surrender to those formerly under his command. The surrender at Appomattox marked the end of the American Civil War, paving the way for a cessation of hostilities, a reunion for the country, and the reconstruction that would follow. With the agreement for surrender secured, Grant sent a telegraph to Washington, informing them of the tremendous news. He told them, General Lee surrendered the Army of Northern Virginia this afternoon on terms proposed by myself. He'd later write in his memoir that his men began firing a hundred-gun salute to celebrate the victory. This did not sit well with Grant, who sent word to have it stopped. He explained the Confederates were now prisoners, and he did not wish to celebrate their downfall. But he was relieved the war was over and prepared himself for the historical future he had ahead. Although the surrender marked the end of hostilities between the two armies, isolated skirmishes continued for a few weeks afterward. But Grant accomplished the impossible task of convincing Lee to surrender, bringing the war to a decisive conclusion. Upon completing his mission, Grant told his men, The war is over. The rebels are our countrymen again. The rest, as they say, is history. So what do you think? Did Lee's pride cost many men their lives? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.